Okay, thank you uh, to Tuan and the uh, symposium organizers for the opportunity to, to present our work. And what I'll tell you about today is how we're making rapid diagnostics uh, using nanoparticles as SERS probes for infectious disease. And um, we all are acutely aware of the importance of uh, infectious diseases because we're living in the midst of a, a global COVID-19 pandemic. But I do want to remind everybody that even before COVID hit the scene, um, there were still a lot of infectious diseases that were you know, of great importance. And so this is a map from the National Institutes of Health um, from 2017, showing basically all the, the diseases that were of concern to them. Um, and you can see that it's, there's a lot. And so some are new, um, some are re-emerging that have gone into hiding and then come back, and some are actually even deliberately released. And our work in my group has focused on a lot of the um, uh, flavor viruses, so things like dengue and Zika and yellow fever, as well as things like Ebola and chikungunya. And what we're interested in is making diagnostics. Um, we, we already know the importance of diagnostics um, um, because you just need somebody, something as a tool to you know, make a call as to what somebody has been infected with. Um, and uh, we saw the importance of them in the beginning of the outbreak. Um, and many of those diseases that I showed you on the map um, have really similar symptoms. So things like fever or nausea or headaches, and these are all common to lots of other diseases. So you need that tool um, to be able to tell you what that patient's been infected with so you can help properly confine that epidemic. Um, if there's human-to-human -human transmission, you can quarantine that person, um, use the information to guide treatment, and then also create maps of where diseases are spreading, so for disease surveillance. And so one format that's really important is to have something that's multiplexed that can differentiate between multiple diseases so that you can make a call as to what somebody's been infected with. So the trio of diseases that we've often been um, concerned with in my group are Zika, Dengue, and Chikungunya. And these are all spread by mosquito-borne diseases, um, mosquitoes, um, and these all reside in the same areas. They tend to be tropical areas that have um, lots of, um, you know, poor infrastructure for water. And so they co-circulate. And these three diseases have really, really similar symptoms. So things like fever and rash and nausea. So um, even though they're in initial symptoms are quite similar, um, their clinical outcomes are dramatically different. So we know now that Zika results in microcephaly for the unborn infant and uh, pregnant women, and also Guillain-Barre, so things like neurological diseases. Um, in the case of dengue, it's totally different. You're at risk for hemorrhagic fever, where your insides break down and you're at risk for bleeding to death. Um, and then uh, uh, chikungunya, you're at risk for um, arthritic pain. Okay, so even though the symptoms are very similar, the disease outcomes are very, very different. Okay, so state of the art for determining these is to use PCR and ELISA. Um, these techniques go after the nucleic acids um, of the material in the case of PCR um, or the proteins if you're looking at um, ELISA. So this can be either antigens that are associated with the disease or the proteins in the virus itself or the proteins, um, the antibodies that you mount in the immune response. And while these techniques are fantastic, if you have access to them, you know, they're very highly sensitive and specific, um, they are not so great in resource limited settings. So this is because they have a very complex methodology to, to operate. Um, they require very expensive reagents um, and uh, sophisticated instrumentation. So you need a specialized person to, in order to operate them. Um, also, they often require a cold um, chain for the transport of the samples and reagents. And so these often have to be occurring in a centralized lab location that has controlled environments, electricity, running water, refrigeration, and so forth. And so if you're missing any of those um, components, you don't have a test. So um, if you go to resource uh, limited settings or poor countries, um, if you go to the medical device, um, uh, medical clinics, you will often see trash heaps behind them that are filled with instruments that are missing one of those components, the person or reagent or something. And so my collaborator, Ani Young and uh, Jose Gomez Marquez, you know, has encountered this over and over again. So recognizing that this is a problem, the World Health Organization has issued guidelines for diagnostics so that go by the assured criteria, so affordable, sensitive, specific, user-friendly, rapid, equipment-free, and deliverable. And we've heard this many times. Um, I want you to keep in mind also that this is sometimes, you know, this is the holy grail, so it's really hard to achieve all of these, but you can see right away that PCR and ELISA do not hit many of these, okay. 
So um, the format that we're interested in are lateral flow tests. Uh, this is the same technology that you see in pregnancy tests, the commercial pregnancy test. And many of you have probably taken a COVID rapid test, which also has the same format. And so just to remind everybody how this works, um, if you have a disease there, you're looking for a biomarker that is uh, indicative of that disease. And you add the sample fluid to this paper strip Okay, and the, the, the sample wicks through by uh, capillary action, so no power is required. Okay, and then if that biomarker is present, it will bind to um, nanoparticles that are dried down in the conjugate pad that, are, um, that have some species on them that can bind to that um, biomarker. And then this complex wicks through, and then immobilized at the, the test line is another species that can also bind to that biomarker um, simultaneously. So this double binding event, what it does is it accumulates gold nanoparticles at the test line. Gold nanoparticles have a very strong optical absorption spectra. So this gives rise due to their surface plasmon resonance. So this gives rise to that visible color that you see in the test window. And then immobilized on the control line is another species that can bind to the nanoparticles particle conjugates themselves, and this gives rise to the second color. So we know that we can see right away that this has many of the requirements for um, the assured guidelines, right? So we can go from sample to answer within 10 minutes. Um, these are really robust and portable. You can stick them in your pocket and carry them around. They're made of low cost materials such as um, glass fiber and paper, um, and they can be manufactured at scale. And the only thing you add is the sample. So all the reagents are contained in the device itself. So this has a lot of promise um, as, a, as a diagnostic in global health settings. Okay, and the gold nanoparticles are there simply to provide the color. Okay, and so uh, we have studied nanoparticle biomolecule interfaces. I do want to point out that there's a lot of interfaces in this um, test. So remember, this is a double binding event where the biomarker of interest binds to both immobilized antibodies um, on the paper and then also on the nanoparticle, but surface effects abound in the system um, quite a bit. So, you know, denaturation, um, you know, or pure orientation of the, of the antibody, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a challenging um, environment. So what we do in my group is we basically study this double binding event of the antigen binding both to the immobilized antibody and the nanoparticle and the other one on the nanoparticle. And what we do is we vary parameters in order to either improve sensitivity of the test or to impart new capabilities that were not possible before. So we do things like vary the nanoparticle size, material, and shape. Uh, also, we change the surface chemistry of the nanoparticle or the conjugation chemistry. We've also studied the effects of the protein corona that forms around these nanoparticles um, in the strip. We've also done things like engineered the paper device to impart new capabilities to the test itself. And then every time we have a new um, target of interest, what we do is we, um, we will uh, uh, change out the antibody so we can target those different antigens. So examples of work in my group has been doing things like making a dengue serotype test that can detect dengue one through four um, in patients. We've also made SARS-CoV-2 tests, both um, to detect the viral proteins as well as an antibody test. Um, we've moved into the food safety arena by looking at um, tests to detect bacterial pathogens inside uh, raw seafood. And then we've also done things to repurpose the antibody in these tests to try to hack them to detect new things that were not possible before. And one thing you may notice in all of these is that they all result in a visible color on the line. So something that you have to see by eye. And this is actually one of the major drawbacks of these lateral flow assays is that, is that they have very limited sensitivity. And that's because you have to accumulate enough nanoparticles on that test line. And so this is, um, you want in order to have a, a better test, you want to have a higher sensitivity. And this is so that you can have um, detect diseases that have very low levels of antigens, or you want to be able to detect the disease earlier on, okay, so for early detection. However, you want to improve the sensitivity in a way that still takes advantage of the format of the lateral flow immunoassay, the paper immunoassay, because it, it helps improve access to these tests. And so one way that we wanted to have both best, the best of both worlds was to utilize another property of those gold nanoparticles, um, which is their ability to enhance Raman spectra. So you know, we know that if you put a molecule next to um, a, a noble metal surface or a noble metal nanoparticle or even some metal oxides, you can enhance the Raman spectrum by several orders of magnitude. So can we use this to increase the sensitivity of our lateral flow assays while still keeping this paper format? Okay, and so we wanted to do this in a way uh, in the format of using um, a nano tag. And so while SIRS can be used to detect proteins themselves, we wanted to use the nano tag format so that we could still take advantage of this multiplex format. So um, we basically have a nanoparticle that's made of gold. We decorate it with um, um, a small molecule reporter, a Raman reporter. And then we also conjugate it to an antibody so that it can bind the biomarker of interest. 
So we still form the sandwich immunoassay in our paper, and basically we read out the presence of that Zika biomarker by the presence of the Raman spectrum on the test line. Okay, And so instead of reading a visual readout, we look for a Raman signal. Then if we want to have a multiplex test to distinguish between uh, dengue, Zika and a different uh, biomarker like that of dengue, we have a different nanotag. It has a different reporter on its surface and conjugated to it an antibody specific for dengue so that if the presence of dengue is read out by the presence of a different spectrum. Okay, And so we're going to do this for both Zika and dengue. So the first thing we need to do is to make nanoparticles. We make nanostars because, um, first of all, they're very easy to make. And then also um, they're stable in biological um, buffers. So they're much more biocompatible than doing an organic phase synthesis. And so we choose um, nanostars with long, um, um, sharp tips so that they can enhance that Raman spectra um, more better in a better way. Okay, then every time we have a new disease, we have to think about the antibodies that are specific for the biomarker of interest. So we always ask, what's the biomarker? For flavoviruses, there's this protein called non-structural protein one that is secreted at high concentrations um, in the blood when you're infected with, with a flavovirus. So this is good because it's secreted very early, right after infection. And so this is right when you're asking that question, you know, what is this person infected with because they have that onset of fever. And this is well before the immune response kicks in. So before IgG and IgM are produced. The other reason that we like NS1 as a biomarker is that people know the levels of how much NS1 is in patient blood when they're infected. And so studies have shown, okay, we know that this biomarker is present at 15 micrograms per microliter, millimilliliter for dengue. Okay, so we're going to use this as a biomarker for Zika and dengue. I do want to point out that Zika and dengue are really similar in the sequences. So this is the NS1 for all four serotypes plus Zika, and there's a lot of overlap. So the antibodies have to be able to distinguish between these two. So we use monoclonal antibodies in order to do so. Okay, now we're ready to synthesize our nanotag. Our nanotag is basically the nanostar with the Raman reporter and the antibody. And what we do is we take our nanostar, we incubate it with our Raman reporter first, um, um, and that decorates the surface of the particle by a physical absorption in the case of BPE or, or by file conjugation in the case of 4MBA. Then we link it to our antibody and that's a two-step process. So we use a dithiol linker that has a hydrazide on the end of it um, that we put on the nanostar. And then what we do is we functionalize the antibody um, by reacting it with sodium periodate. This tends to form aldehydes concentrated in the anti-FC group, uh, which is basically far away from where it binds to the antigen. And then we take this and we react these two together and these form a conjugated bond by uh, click chemistry. So we see an increase in size in the DLS, we see a change in the zeta potential, and these all confirm that um, the nanotag was made. We also do peg backfills with a thylated peg to passivate any um, you know, open surfaces on the gold nanostar to prevent nonspecific absorption. Um, then we go and measure enhancement. We see that enhancement um, uh, basically, we measured uh, the BPE by itself, that's shown in gray. We look at the enhancement when it's on the nanostar, that's shown in purple. And um, by looking at the, the peak at 1609, we get enhancement factors of on the order of 10 to the 5. And this is not the most spectacular enhancement factor, but we figured it was good enough to move forward with um, for our tests. Uh, we do the same thing with the dengue nanotag. We measure the 4MBA by itself, that's shown in gray, um, on the nanostars in pink, and then we get enhanced factors, you know, roughly the same, same range. Okay, we also find that if we change the shape of the nanoparticle to spheres, we don't get nearly as good enhancement, and so we stick with the nanostars moving forward. Then what we do is we construct our tests and we do them individually first. So first we're gonna measure um, Zika NS1 in a dipstick immunoassay. And we wanted to ask the question, can you use SIRS in the paper format? And what is, and second of all, if we can, what is the um, limited detection? So we construct basically what we call a half strip. So instead of using a dry conjugate pad, we have a solution instead. So there's a paper strip that has an anti-Zika NS1 antibody painted down on this location and an anti-FC for the control location, and then a paper wick for the fluid sink. And then what we do is we dunk it in a solution that contains the nanotag plus or minus the Zika NS1. And what we do is we vary the concentration of the NS1. So here's a strip where we have a high concentration of NS1. You can see a visual color that has resulted, and this indicates that there's been a sandwich that's been formed at this location. If we do the same test with no NS1 present, we get no color in the test line, which indicates that no sandwich was formed, okay, which is a, basically the negative control. And then we vary the NS1 in all concentrations in between, and we can see that the intensity of this test line goes up. Okay? And then what we do is we actually try to measure the SIR spectrum of this 
location. And you can see that as we increase the concentration of the NS Zika NS1, we see this spectra increase in intensity. And this is indicative of BPE, which means that we're reading the presence of the NS1 by measuring the BPE spectrum. So what we do is we quantify the LOD by taking this ROM intensity at the BPE peak as a function of NS1 concentration. We get um, an LOD of, um, uh, of, of this number of 0.72 nanograms per mil. If we compare it to the test line intensity by the visual readout, which is 11 nanograms per mil, we see that we can increase the LOD by, decrease the LOD by 15 fold. So this means that we can use SIRS to read out or test and that it improves the LOD. Um, we do the same thing uh, for the dengue test shown here. Same thing. Okay, now we're only using dengue antibodies and a dengue nanotag and dengue NS1. We see the same thing. We see the intensity of the test line increase with NS1 concentration. This time when we measure the SIR spectra of the test area, we get four MBA spectra showing up. And if we measure the LOD and the visual OD and, and, and compare it, we see that we improve um, the LOD by sevenfold. Okay, so we can also do this for dengue individually. Okay. Um, and then what we do is we um, uh, combine them together. And so we have a single strip. Um, this time at this test area, we mix both dengue and Zika antibodies together um, and we run it with a mixture of the nanotags um, and uh, either the Zika NS1 or the dengue NS1 or both or neither. Okay, and this is the test results that show up here. So if Zika is present, we got a color showing up at the test line. So does the same thing for dengue. Okay, we can't differentiate between the, between the two. And then same for the mixture. We basically see a colored spot. And if nothing is run, we basically see no color show up. Okay, however, if we take the serous spectra at this test line location, we can differentiate between the biomarker that has shown up. So in the case of Zika, we get the blue spec, the dark blue spectra. In the case of dengue, we get the, um, the light blue spectra shown here. And in case of the mixture, we get the orange one. And these spectra, the mixture is a mixture of both the 4MBA and the BPE spectra. So this allows us to distinguish between these two this, between the two biomarkers or the mixture by measuring the spectra that results. So it's impossible to use this in a multiplex format. I do want to point out that even if we have nothing present, we still even do get some signal present. And this goes to show you that even though you can't see it by eye, um, SIRS is an incredibly sensitive technique. So we still see the spectra um, you know, showing up. So there is some non-specific signal sometimes. Kimberly, two minutes. Okay, great. So we've also done things to extend this um, to other things. We've looked at multiplex uh, reporters. So how do you move before, beyond two? Um, we've come up with a way to distinguish between uh, basically how to choose the best five reporters that have the minimal um, uh, have minimal overlap, and then also ways to separate the spectra when you have mixtures. Uh, and we have also moved on to using different kinds of particles to improve the sensitivity. Uh, we've done, we partnered with Vinter Puentes in order to use gold silver um, nanoshells, basically taking advantage of the high sensitivity of the high enhancement factor of the silver, as well as the biocompatibility of the gold. Um, and we've used this in order to detect um, um, uh, MXA, which is a protein that can distinguish between uh, viral and bacterial infections. Um, and so finally, in, in, in summary, hopefully I've shown you that search can be used in this paper format. Um, you can use it in a multiplex way to distinguish between diseases um, and our further work using improved um, uh, nanoparticles and then our techniques to distinguish between multiple reporters means that we can move on to more diseases. So finally, I did I thank my uh, group for um, their, their work on this, uh, funding from the NIH um, and also UMass Boston. Thank you.